Now here we are in Teatro, we're at the home of Steve Braunius, the writer, raconteur, the satirist, and we're going to invade his home, have a look at what's in his record collection, see what is on his bookshelves, that sort of thing. Just push the doorbell. Ah, Steve. Oh, g'day, Paul. How are you? How's it going? Come on in. Would you like a cup of tea? I'd love a cup of tea. Great. That was very natural. <laughs> that was good, wasn't it? Did you hear the doorbell? No, I didn't hear the doorbell. So we're trying to recreate one of those scenes there that you see on TV when people turn up and say hi, but uh, <laughs> I think you caught us out. But where's the doorbell? I mean, um, it's up here, is it? Oh, there it is. Oh, you, you, you stay here. I'll stay here and you yeah, go, you go I'll, ring I'll, it. We'll I'll get, ring the doorbell. We'll get the sound oh, effect. Oh. That's lovely. Quite subtle. It's quite a, it's quite a, it's quite a calming doorbell as opposed to <laughs> something that gives, puts you on edge immediately. That's right. Now, would you literally like a cup of yeah, tea? Yeah, I would literally like a cup yeah, of tea. Cool. Thank you. So, how long have you been living in in Te Oh, two years. Two years, one month, and uh, yeah, we absolutely love it. It's all watery and pale and fecund. You have got a lot of fruit on your trees in the backyard, that's impressive. Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of juicing goes on here, uh, on the tangelos and the grapefruits. Um, <laughs> I say to a guy the other day, so I was offering him a whole bunch of fruit. He said, oh, you know, <coughs> this, will, this will keep you alive uh, a bit longer. And he said, yeah, at this rate I'll be like, I won't be able to die till I'm 110 and it'll be all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> And was that part of the reason you bought the house when you saw the fruit trees? Yeah, it really was. The yeah. fruit trees, the uh, big veggie patch out there, and um, as soon as I saw that, you know, I was uh, filled with wild surmise about what I could possibly grow out there. Uh, big militant rows of sweet corn, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and, and just the whole sort of... Um, Topography and geography uh, of living on a peninsula I found really appealing. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got you got the ocean that way and you got the mountains that yeah, way. Yeah. Just the sort of sort of the definition, you know, it's this this sort of jutting archipelago surrounded by water on all sides. I found that really really very fetching. Although um, the better uh, peninsula in, in Auckland is the one just next door, Rosebank Peninsula, is really quite a very elegantly shaped peninsula. And it's shaped by two, um, by by by, by uh, Henderson Creek on one side. Yeah, I I, I did this thing recently where I, uh, I decided to see if it was possible to walk from home to the uh, international airport and drew a uh, drew a kind of a map and it took me from here through the Rosebank uh, Peninsula. And uh, even though you're going through an industrial kind of um, you know industrial estate. It was, it was like a nature walk, you know, because the water was so sort of ever-present and lapping at your feet a lot of the way. And the trees, uh, citrus trees were everywhere. It used to be a Auckland's market garden, apparently. Right. Hmm. So do you still... No. Do you drive? Nope. You still don't drive? Nope. Milk? Is it, yes, please. Is that a, a source of amazement for other Aucklanders that you meet? Yeah, it does seem to be. Yeah, amazement is, is one thing that they <laughs> register. Uh, it's usually more a, a kind of a disgust, really. I know, I'm, I'm fighting it in myself, but, <laughs> I, but I know <laughs> you're a nice guy and I know that if you don't want to drive, you don't have to drive. Thank it's you. It's not compulsory, is it? No, well, no, it's not. Um, I mean, I do... Uh, you know, the years of, of, of fielding the barely concealed disgust <laughs> that you're uh, experiencing, uh, it does make me feel quite ashamed about it. It's, it's, yeah. nothing I'm very, it's nothing I'm proud about. It's nothing that I've willfully, you know, tried to achieve. It's just, uh, it's sheer incompetence, you know. It's, I just don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do it. That's all it is. There's nothing complex about it. So it's not. It's a. So it's a fear of learning to do it. It's a. It's a mechanical stupidity. I guess at a at a kind of extreme. Everyone else seems to be able to drive, don't they? Uh, I just opt out. I don't have anything medical. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm as fit as a fiddle. 
Uh, but it's spatially I, fairly aware, right. I suppose. But uh, I just I never considered it. Never the whole time I was growing up. Right. Nope, never. Oh well, after this cup of tea, oh, we'll take you outside and we'll, we'll have a driving lesson. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, well, I have had some. I have had some. And how did they go? Uh, the, there was the Volkswagen, which ended up in Wellington Harbour. That was kind of dramatic. There was the Land Rover that ended up in a snowdrift near um, Lake Tekapo. That was also fairly dramatic. Um, a Holden Kingsford that. Kingswood. Kingswood, was it? Um, that never drove again. Okay. That was a bad These one. are all cars of a different era, though, so I'm s sensing this was a while back. Um, no, that's over four different decades. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah. seriously, mm -hmm. it's led to a lot of, it's, it's kind of informed your work, so to speak, a lot, because a lot of what you pick up is the stuff you see when you're walking, I'm, I'm surmising. <clears throat> I guess so, I guess so, I wonder if that has, yeah, I mean I've been doing a, a kind of a, not, not quite a series, but in the past, uh, you know, 18 months or so I've been going on these walks, and when I was just describing to you, well, I wanted to see whether it was possible to walk from my house to the airport. And that was a 12 day, a 12 hour, a 12 day marathon, ridiculous. So you made it? Oh yeah, I made it, I made it. And the bigger one, the bigger slog though, by about eight kilometers, and I think this was like a 30, 32 kilometer hike, I wanted to walk the length, or as much of the length of possible as New Zealand's longest street, the Great South Road. Uh, I read about this. You 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 wrote this in Metro magazine. Yeah, yeah. It was a, a fascinating read, but you didn't make it all the way, did you? I didn't quite make it all the way. I started where it begins on the on a corner near uh, Newmarket, which is you know one of Auckland's richest um, suburbs, and it was yeah right beside where all the, they're selling all these you know European cars and things like that. And as you went further south, uh, it became more. Uh, socio-economically undesirable I guess you would say and I think I went through about you know six suburbs um, and I got to just past Manurewa and I was trying to get to um, yeah I had a goal in mind I wanted to get to Papakura and I would catch the train back from Papakura and um, I wasn't that far shy I was about six kilometers shy and uh, but it was getting dark, I was in an unfamiliar semi-rural territory with guys walking past wearing hoods and I thought this probably wasn't wise and I was shattered as well, just shattered. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Are you going to attempt it again? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So well, is, is I, what I, I'd like to go the other way, I'd like to go from south to north, I'd like to you know, take the early morning uh, train, which you can do on, on Kiwi Rail, uh, to Papakura. It stops at Papakura and walk back um, from there. I'd love to do that. that. That would have a whole different kind of psychic charge to it. Um, because when you go from north to south, you're, you know, you're leaving Auckland, you're discovering New Zealand, and all those kinds of feelings are really prevalent and give you this terrific lift and a kind of you know, dynamic charge as you're walking along. That your destination is, is New Zealand. Yeah. You know, you're about to cross you know, the, the famous Bombays. You're about to rid this place. So to do it the other way and to come back into Auckland, I wonder how that would feel, you know, possibly, possibly disappointing or something like that. I don't know, I'll find out. So this is, this is your den and this is, I guess, where you write a lot of your stuff? This is where I write all my stuff, yeah. This is where the magic doesn't happen. Just um, hard, patient, sometimes happy work. Yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I, I've still got uh, probably about a hundred or so uh, albums on vinyl, which I occasionally, you know, will play some, uh, but most of my stuff is on um, CD. Uh, I like looking at them, I like objects, um, I like books. Um, yeah, I really like books. This whole Kindle thing uh, it drives me nuts, you know, it's just, it's not a... <laughs> Conversations about Kindle versus books are incredibly limited, aren't they? There doesn't seem to be anything particularly interesting to say about the, about the whole subject. I've certainly never read or listened to anything interesting about it. Um, 
I think it's just a kind of a visceral thing with me. I loathe Kindle. I can't stand reading your telephone. I can't stand reading uh, text which has been patiently composed on a uh, on a screen. I think it's crazy. This bookcase is full of books that I've never given back. It's full of that bookcase is a is a gallery of guilt. To tell you the truth. Yes, yes. Overdue library books or just friends books? Oh no, friends books. I'm seeing a, a book on Steely Dan, which I owe uh, David Slack for about six years. Is a great Western uh, novel, which I owe Bob Orr, the celebrated poet. Sorry, Bob. Sorry, David. <laughs> Not getting them back either. There's a reason that they haven't been returned, is that I just want to keep them. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey there. Can't see it. Can't see it. <laughs> is there? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's not. There's L- L- Lolita, but that's kind of um, that's literature, isn't it? Yes, that's literature. Lolita. Yes. Well, I think that's that's the greatest book of English language ever written. Is it right? Yeah, I really do. I, I, it's just a, exhilarating the way that he's discovering and relishing the English language. Nabokov in that particular book, incredibly funny. Uh, still you know terribly disturbing at all the, at, at, at every kind of level Amos describes it as one of the great books of hate um, who's yeah, this lady Karen Dalton uh, a title track from in my own time um, I believe she was some kind of um, uh, uh, Red Indian uh, uh, pers- uh, ancestry. American singer. Um, this is recorded in around about 1971, which is kind of a uh, year zero for me. Um, without really deliberately setting out to do so, I've kind of been trying to limit uh, the music that I want to listen to in this house to the years roughly 1969 to 75. And I really don't want to be listening to anything else. I'm sort of developing wild theories which have got to be tamed and, and should be repressed about punk rock destroying and ruining and derailing music uh, forever after. You know, these sorts of opinions are just absurd and wild. Uh, but you form them when you're uh, living in this kind of musical bubble. But anyway, yeah, this is Karen Dalton coming up. Um, I, I, just the most incredible singer. The tone to her voice is just so beautiful. Um, I don't know what she's actually singing about. I don't like listening to words in songs. I really dislike lyrics and paying much attention to them. Um, but the emotion of it is uh, incredibly fetching. Yesterday Any way you made it was bad.
Well, congratulations on the award for your yes, book, you. Civilization: Twenty Places on the Edge of the World. Tell us how this this began, because this is kind of a, this is also I think this is this is my theory. I think this has also got to do with you not driving. <laughs> yeah, gosh, yes, you've. Uh, it's a very revealing remark, actually. This is probably New Zealand's only book about being on the road, written by someone who can't drive. The uh, secret power of this book, which is um, unacknowledged throughout, is that Jane Usher was present at every single page, you could say, of this book as the driver uh, through all 20 places. Um, it started off as a series uh, for North and South magazine. They had approached me to see whether I wanted to do something and I said, yeah, I want to... Um, uh, the idea I had is that I would go to towns that nobody had ever heard of where nothing had ever happened or nothing was likely to happen and write thousands of words about them and they f uh, thought that was an okay idea. Uh, but to go to those places and to... Um, I needed, you know, an escort and I also wanted to, to, you know, evoke them for a magazine as a photo essay and uh, the best photographer in the country I think is Jane Usher. So we teamed up uh, for that series for a couple of years um, and it very quickly became the work that I became most fascinated by as a journalist and as someone who writes and I kept wondering what it was leading towards and what the themes were that were going on um, and I needed to write about these places at greater length as well than the magazine could accommodate and, and they were being very generous about the number of pages. So I thought, right, I've got to stop writing about them uh, for the magazine and I'm just going to go and visit these places and write about them for a book. And that's exactly what I did. Um, thanks to the generous backing of the uh, Copyright Licensing Non-Fiction Award. Um, and that saw me through the, uh, the year of uh, going to these places and researching them. Uh, well, when I say researching them, I just went to these places without any knowledge about them and talked to strangers on the street, you know, um, which could sometimes be, a, um, you know, took a bit of willpower to do. I'm naturally a very uh, shy and withdrawn person and going up to people who you've never met before and asking them about the town that they live in could, could you know, it was sometimes very, uh, I just couldn't do it sometimes almost. But anyway, uh, you always got over that because the people in all of these places, um, like New Zealanders everywhere, were incredibly generous with their time, you know, and they really wanted to talk about the place that they lived in uh, with either affection or with other kinds of uh, <laughs> feelings, you could say. And... Um, yeah, yeah, and I, um, yeah, I spent the whole year going to these places and writing about them uh, for the book, and uh, you know, it was. You were never really sure how, how, if it was if I was doing an effective job. Um, you're constantly aware of your limitations as a writer, and by the time that the book came out, I'd I'd really had a crisis in confidence about it. Uh, so when you saw me at the uh, the book launch, um, I was you know close to despair about the book actually. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Because you thought it wasn't. I just thought it was terrible. I, I honestly did. I, I'd had a crisis. I thought this was, you know, one of the perhaps one of the worst books which had ever been published in this country. And I had this the ambition that I had for the book is that it would escape notice. You know, it would, would sell like a lead balloon. It would not get reviewed because if it did get reviewed, people would inevitably say, this is terrible. This, the failure of imagination here is, is, is astonishing. And, um, yeah, I, I, I remember being very pale at the book launch um, and afraid. And is, is this something you felt with, other, with your other books? Was this unique to this one? It was unique to this one. It wasn't like I, you know, I'm, I'm not a confidence player. You know, I'm not someone who's 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 full of confidence and brio about their own work. Um, but yeah, I certainly never felt uh, as bad 
right. about a project. A project is this one, and um, it it um, it took a while for me to. I mean, I'm happy to say, you know, that I've kind of changed my mind on this, yeah, and that it's well, so. doesn't seem too bad a book. You know, it won the award. It got some really good reviews, and and I felt a hell of a lot better about. David Crosby. So David Crosby, is he one of the Beach Boys? <laughs> no, he wasn't no. Crosby, Stills and Nash? Yeah, yes, yes, That's Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young. Uh, the first name on that billing. Uh, yeah, David Crosby is his, uh, his, his debut solo album called If I Could Only Remember My Name. Uh, ridiculous title. Uh, preposterous person, really. Um, he was really brazen and proud of uh, how many drugs he took and uh, you know sort of a drug casualty who's managed to survive they came here in 2012 Crosby, Stills and Nash and uh, played in Henderson um, sounds like they played at someone's house mm-hmm. isn't it it was actually at a, at a stadium uh, and I was really moved by it I actually wept when they came on stage uh, partly because they were, you know, uh, quite, quite, the music that they were doing were quite beautiful. And also just the fact that they were still there, you know, that they had survived. And, and, and you know, particularly Crosby, I think, it wasn't so much that he survived, you know, fame and all the stuff that that inevitably and invariably does to people, but that he'd survived something much worse and something much more threatening, and that's himself. You know, he, he's a, a ridiculous person, his outsized ego, everything was sort of big about him, his appetite for drugs, his appetite for uh, stupidity, it was quite outstanding. But yeah, there was a small period there in his life of about two or three years when um, I think the guy was possessed of genius, and I think it came out especially when he did the solo album, and it's an album of great sort of poise really, for someone who was so absurd and extravagant, uh, he really did exercise an enormous amount of restraint and taste when he made the solo album. Uh, it's got luminaries such as Jerry Garcia from The Grateful Dead on it, and Neil Young. I think Joni Mitchell is floating around in the background. And uh, yeah, this particular song I, I'm playing, uh, would like to play, it um, seems to be based on some sort of technique of drones. He was really into the technique of drones as a kind of a music. Um, lyrically, it's possibly profound, uh, but like I was saying before, I do my level best not to listen to lyrics. I, I have a feeling um, they would disappoint me greatly if I did. But he's a beautiful singer, he had a lovely voice, and I hope you like this. What's the song, song called? Uh, the song is called Laughing.
was mistaken Only a child laughing In the sun In part three of our home invasion of award-winning writer and satirist Steve Braunius, he talks about some of his favourite books, including one he refers to as his Bible. Yesterday. You've got a lot of books in your house, Steve, which I'm, I'm not surprised by. There's bookcases in the garage, there's bookcases in the hallway, there's bookcases here in your den. Uh, and I asked you to get out some books that, that you would uh, like to talk about, some books that, that, uh, that yeah. mean something to you or... That whatever just yeah. just some interesting books yeah gosh you know i mean i, I could i could honestly have, have selected you know blindly any three books and 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 and, and talked about them at, at 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 great length i just absolutely love the books that i've got i really do uh, but yeah the three that i that i that i took out uh, they include uh joe gould's secret by joseph mitchell he was a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine, and uh, this book is a collection. He wrote two profiles of a bum called Joe Gould, who lived in New York. Uh, and these profiles were written around about 30 years apart. The first one was written around about in the, in the 40s or so. And then the second one, um, about the same guy, is written a lot. Is written a lot later, and um, it's it's um, it's really the most devastating piece of work by a journalist I think I've read. I I couldn't get this one out of my mind for weeks after reading it. And the revelations which are divulged in the second book about this character, Joe Gould, the bum, were... I, I never saw them coming. Um, it was just so sort of beautifully and sensitively and patiently done. Patience isn't a virtue, really, which, which journalists, uh, um, <laughs> you know, are taught or possess particularly. And this guy, um, the, 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 the author Joseph Mitchell, had this quality of watchfulness and not telling you the truth about what he had discovered until right at the very end. A really incredible achievement. And um, 
So by bum, you mean homeless guy? Yeah, yeah, a hobo, a bum, an alcoholic, who who had made extravagant claims. And there's also the very fetching kind of tale of Joseph Mitchell himself, the the second profile about Joe Gould. Uh, was the last thing he wrote for the uh, New Yorker magazine and yet he remained on staff and he showed up for work every day he would take the elevator to his floor he would um, hang his umbrella up and his hat and he had his own office and he would go and sit in his office from around about 8am to 4pm and he did that every day for around about, I think it's 25 years, and he never wrote anything. Wow. He never wrote another word. And they, uh, I guess they revered him so much and acknowledged him as this great master that no one said anything. They let him alone. He wasn't mentally unwell. He wasn't like a nut. He was functioning and he was capable. But he never interviewed anybody. He never wrote another word. And they, he drew a good salary. And this went on for a hell of a long time. Isn't that the most incredible story. The book Joe Gould's Secret was made into a movie in the year 2000. Ian Holm played Joe Gould, while Stanley Tucci directed and appeared as the journalist Joseph Mitchell. In my hometown, I never felt at home. In New York, in New York City, in Greenwich Village, down among the cranks and the misfits and the one-lungers, and the has-beens, and the might have beens and the would-bees, and the never-wills, and the God-knows-whats. I have always felt at home. Joe Gould told me that when I was first writing about him, not knowing that I felt the same. As time went on, I would learn that this was not the only thing we had in common. This one, what's that one? Uh, right, this is kind of like a Bible for me. Uh, Lytton Strachey's book, Eminent Victorians, um, which uh, are four profiles of uh, four very famous um, people who lived in the Victorian age, including Florence Nightingale. And, yeah, uh, I, I regard this book as kind of like the father of, of, of modern journalism. It's, um, it's scabrous, it's, it's vicious, it's virulent, it's incredibly funny. It came out of nowhere, it was a smash hit. Um, he's writing biographies, biographies of these four people who were revered in their own time and at that time. And for someone to come along of, of exquisite breeding, his language was, you know, masterful, and to be so appalling about these people who are national heroes uh, was just so shocking. And I guess there was some kind of appetite for it. People bought it in his droves, and it made him very rich and set him up for life, I guess. Um, so before this, people had been very uh, had had been very positive towards famous people. Is that what you're saying? Kind of. I mean, he really reinvented biography as a form. You know, uh, biography had been very conservative for the main part, and and went on familiar lines. Somebody was born in chapter one, and in the last chapter they very sadly pass away. Uh, this guy, Strachey, didn't take that approach at all and, and he was trying to build a thesis about the whole Victorian age and how it was a failure and how it led England to war and ultimately cost the lives of thousands of people. And he was looking at the values of, of that England which had set this up. And um, so he, 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 he to, to represent those values he chooses these four people, a, uh, a clergyman, 
uh, someone in the military, uh, a great educator, and Florence Nightingale. And it's it's merciless. It's 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 re- I mean it's just it's truly breathtaking. You know I mean it's written in 1914. So good lord, how about that centenary coming up? That'll be marked. You know this is a really important book. But yeah, like 99 years on, uh, it's just breathtaking, and and the the verve and the imagination of it too. Um, I mean even today this is this is it's revolutionary. This is not strict history, this is not strict biography and it's certainly not strict journalism, which is to say that it's not a hundred percent accurate. It really isn't. And he, he doesn't explicit, explicitly say that. Um but you know it's pretty clear that a lot of this is the uh, the act of, of of some of of imagination and that you you know he's imagining things um which have a kind of which have an absolute truth to them he's not he's not clowning around it's, it's a real terrific purpose to it and uh yeah a real a, a absolute hero of mine uh you know and and his whole approach and all of that would would mean nothing to me but for the fact of his writing is just so fantastic it's just wonderful incredible feeling for language and 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 fantastic wit there's a real irrepressible energy about this guy what's it called again uh eminent victorians this is from uh eminent victorians and this is strachey's uh portrait of cardinal manning a high churchman and uh i'm going to choose a particular paragraph which is uh towards the end of that portrait and towards the end of manning's life and uh, this is uh, trying to speak before about the daringness and the verve of Strachey, his inventiveness, that you could dare to do that in a biography of somebody. Did the following take place? You be the judge. But the writing is just absolutely beautiful. When the guests were gone and the great room was empty, the old man would draw himself nearer to the enormous fire and review once more, for the thousandth time, the long adventure of his life. He would bring out his diaries and his memoranda. He would arrange his notes. He would turn over again the yellow leaves of faded correspondences. Seizing his pen, he would pour out his comments and reflections, and fill, with an extraordinary solicitude, page after page with elucidations, explanations, justifications, of the vanished incidents of a remote past. He would snip with scissors the pages of ancient journals and with delicate ecclesiastical fingers drop unknown mysteries into the flames. How do we know wow. that? That's, we know <laughs> that, that? That is beautiful though, isn't it? <laughs> Sniff the delicate ecclesiastical fingers. Uh, 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 that's just breathtaking. I, I spend all my entire writing life trying to approach anything as fabulous as that image. Our guest for the hour, Auckland writer Stephen Braunius, talking about the book Eminent Victorians by Lytton Strachey. The other book discussed was Joe Gould's Secret by Joseph Mitchell. And we'll leave you with another of Steve's musical choices. This is For a Spanish Guitar by Gene Clark. Oh, the dissonant bells of the sea Who are ringing Rhymes of the deep as they sing of the ages asleep, not so near or so far. And the old master's wind of the waves sped forth for the free men and slaves, whispers of secrets it saves. And about whom they are And the workings of sunshine and rain And the visions they paint that remain Pulsate from my soul through my brain And a Spanish guitar miserable throne of defeat Envisions no wealth there to meet Thinking nowhere is far 
and the laughter of children employed by the fantasies not yet destroyed by the dogmas of those they avoid knowing not what they are and the right and the wrong and insane and the answers they cannot explain pulsate from my soul through my brain and a Spanish guitar to play on a Spanish guitar with the sun shining down where you are skipping and singing a bar from the music around just to laugh through the columns of trees to soar like a sea and breeze to stand in the rain if you please or to never be found 